Hello, my name is Josh Gilliland, blogger for Bowtie Law and The Legal Geeks. Thank you for joining us today for an overview of electronic discovery. We'll focus on what is electronically stored information and define the terms of art you see in electronic discovery. First up, ESI. It stands for Electronically Stored Information. It is defined under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure, Rule 34. ESI is data compilations stored in any medium that can be translated into a reasonably usable form. To have a more in-depth overview of Rule 34, the code defines ESI as virtually anything, writings, drawings, graphs, charts, photographs, basically anything that's electronic stored in any medium that can be obtained either directly or if necessarily, after translation by the responding party into a reasonably usable form. Key language to understanding Federal Rule of Civil Procedure, Rule 34. Now, when the rules were amended in 2006, they were, it was some forward thinking on how to define this term of art. Because we're not going to reissue the rules. We're not going to go through the entire rulemaking process and get approval by Congress if, if necessary uh, based upon uh, you know, product releases coming out every six months. And the rulemakers thought about this. So the advisory committee note states under uh, the notes to Rule 34 that the rules are to be broad enough to encompass future changes and development. Very important because the last major revision to the rules on this were in 1971. You know, we were walking on the moon at that point in time and, you know, computers were very different, let alone anything, you know, considered personal computers being used and, you know, just, just wasn't the same world we have today. So the rule makers, again, very forward thinking and making sure that our rules will be flexible. So it's very important to remember that virtually all the states now, there's just a handful that do not have their own equivalent rules to deal with electronic discovery. The California Civil Discovery Act has been amended back in 2009 to include electronic and electronically stored information. The definitions are slightly different but very similar. Under the California rules, electronic uh, is defined as relating to technology having electronic, digital, magnetic, wireless, optical, optical or electromagnetic uh, capabilities. Additionally, ESI is defined as information that is stored in an electronic medium. Moving forward, let's take a look at the terms of art because this is where people can get very confused. Native file. A native file is electronically stored information in its original application. For example, a Word document's you know, native application would be Word. Excel would be Excel. So again, very important to remember that and we'll talk more about the significance of that when we get to metadata. If you want an image of ESI, so you can conduct redactions on it or you want to make sure that nothing's changed or perhaps it's ESI that has to go through a translation so it can be in a reasonably usable form, you're potentially looking at an image of ESI. So a static image is a native file that's been petrified in a way and it's been converted to something such as a TIFF or a PDF. Those are static images of electronically stored information. Form production. This is one of the battlegrounds under Rule 34. It is how ESI is produced. So when you state your request for electronically stored information, you can state what form you want it in. For example, you can say produce all email messages from 2009 to 2010 between John Doe and Jane Smith in native file format. You can also state that you, if you want something as a static image, that it should be produced as a TIFF with associated metadata. So several ways that you can request it, and it's very important to remember the party who's requesting electronically stored information can state the terms on how it is to be produced. Now the requesting party has the right to object and to state a different form if, if they have to and that's where we see the most battles taking place and motions to compel. But this is a very good topic for a meet and confer so both parties can agree on forms of production. Perhaps email messages are converted to PDF with metadata 
and Excel files are produced natively. So again, different, different flavors of ESI and forms of production you can see in a case. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. If you are taking paper and you're scanning it to an electronic form, the text on that piece of paper, if it's typed, can be, uh, you know, go through an optical character recognition software so that underlying text becomes readable. So we can conduct searches for, you know, optical or whatever other words are, are on that piece of uh, that document. If we have ESI that's been converted to a static image and redactions done to it, that would also potentially need to be OCR. However, ESI itself should not need to be OCR because it's already inherently searchable because of the metadata and the embedded text within those native files. Collection. ESI doesn't just naturally exist in a lawsuit. You have to collect it somehow. That's normally done by a professional that who's hired by the attorneys or somebody who's in-house with a large corporate party that goes in and uses special software or special devices to preserve and collect the data off of computers, smartphones, whatever devices are at issue in a lawsuit. For example, we have here a picture of a smartphone underneath a collection device so pictures can actually be taken of the phone to capture uh, what's on the screen as an image. Software could be used and the device connected to the phone itself and the data on the phone extracted. You can do the same with a computer. You also can be very strategic in how you think because you might not need to collect information more than once. A smartphone could be backed up to a computer. And potentially, you do not need to image both the phone and the computer because you could get all the information from one source, say just the computer for conducting a search on that machine. Processing. After information is collected, it then needs to be processed to be readable in one of the popular review platforms. And, and here's the quote from uh, and the definition from the Sedona Conference Glossary defining processing, which is defined as an automated computer workflow where native data is ingested by any number of software programs designed to extract text and selected metadata and then normalize the data for packaging into a format for the eventual loading into a review platform. Very important. Also, this is really established technology at this point in time. It, it's done by professionals who've been trained how to use it. Uh, you, it's, it's very you know, well defined at this point after many years of, of being used. Document review. Perhaps the backbone of civil litiga litigation, definitely the most expensive. In the bad old days of document review, there were young associates who would be placed at their desks and who would do the, the yeoman's labor of going through you know, boxes one piece of paper at a time. Today's technology enables us to work a lot smarter and faster with uh, different work options. One option is hosted review platforms. Whether it's a small firm or a mega firm, data can be hosted by a service provider or this technology could be brought in-house and attorneys, whether they are working at home or from the office or, or off a tablet PC, can access databases, conduct review, run searches, find what they need, and review and make notes, tag what is relevant, uh, redact what they need to. Uh, if they're very technologically savvy and they have a well thought out plan, they're conducting their review for causes of action, they're looking for defenses, and they're making notes as they go. And they're using the tags strategically so that way they can find what they need when they actually get to motion practice and discovery responses and, and make the most of the review platform so they can focus on the practice of law and not reviewing you know, email messages one message at a time. There are other technologies out there that you should be aware of. For example, early case data assessment can be used to winnow down data sets to, to what's relevant to the lawsuit. Perhaps you look for all the email messages from the attorneys by looking for their law firm domain name 
and you bulk tag all of that as potentially privileged because it's coming from the attorneys, arguably giving legal advice, and while well, further review should, you know, should be done to, to determine that, potentially you can do a bulk review that way. Additionally, you can call out you know, domain names that you know will not be relevant, such as if you have news updates, if you have sales alerts from different you know, vendors by looking for their domain names, you can start eliminating large volumes of email messages that are just not relevant to the case. Now what's this look like? Now here's one product that actually shows different relationships between messages. Um, many programs have this visual analytics built into it and it's extremely helpful because human beings are, are visual creatures. And when you can see relationships or you can see spikes in when uh, communications were taking place, uh, it can enable you to focus in on the review that you need to conduct and key time periods. So that way you can tell the story uh, if you're getting to trial practice or if you're conducting depositions, uh, whatever the case may be. Early case data assessment technology is absolutely wonderful when it comes to identifying initial disclosures. Given the timing that you have to make initial disclosures from you know, filing of the complaint or when you've been served to the time of the first uh, meet and confer, to the first case management conference and the scheduling order that needs to be issued. Um, you can look for information that supports your claims or defenses based upon the allegations of the complaint, perhaps keywords that you've come up with after conducting interviews with your client, determine custodians, determine date ranges and file types. All of this information could be used very effectively in an early case data assessment tool to find what you need so you can make your initial disclosures. Data analytics. There, this is a hot topic in 2012. It deals extensively with computer assisted review, which is actually a very broad topic when you consider all the ways that you can conduct document review and find what you need. But data analytics is synonymous with predictive coding. And when you have a reviewer who's highly knowledgeable about a case and in a practice area and they work with a core set of documents and the size of that core set will you know, be based upon the size of the case, the amount of documents you might need to review. Well, you review that seed set and as the attorney reviews, the software learns what's relevant from that review and starts identifying other areas, other ESI, that could also potentially be responsive. This is a wonderful technology in being able to find what you need faster. So you can focus on the merits of the case and the actual practice of law, as opposed to an army of contract attorneys conducting document review. So again, one of the many tools out there. There are others as well. We have wonderful you know, other data analysis tools that can show relationships between email and other technology that, that's very, very powerful. Finally, we'll close with metadata because there are different flavors of metadata that you should look at. Now, there's been a rash of case management orders where courts have actually stated, based upon the parties agreeing, that metadata would not be produced absent good cause very, very dangerous for, for parties to be doing this because categorically stating no metadata is destroying the searchability of that ESI and rendering useless all the products that could be used to find information faster. They're effectively taking what's searchable and reducing its searchable characteristics and making things worse. So one area of metadata that you can consider is substantive metadata. And that reflects changes made by a user, including prior edits or editorial comments. If you're dealing with a case involving breach of contract or formulas being developed for you know, drug or patent litigation, this is the type of metadata you want. You want to know when changes took place. You want to look at all of that underlying information to see who knew what when. So again, categorically denying this without good cause, very dangerous. Moreover, processing engines can do this easily. So it's not like technology is limited in being able to identify it. 
embedded metadata. Embedded metadata consists of text, numbers, content, data, or other information. Categorically stating no embedded metadata by the brute language of no metadata without good cause, also very, very dangerous because again, embedded metadata can help you find what you need to support your claims or defenses. And stripping a production of embedded metadata is arguably changing the ESI and rendering it more difficult to use. Finally, system metadata reflects information created by the user or by the organization's information management system. Maybe this is relevant to your case, maybe it's not. And the other, same could be said for the others. But whatever the case, analyze the data that you have. And before anyone states categorically no metadata without good cause, think about that before anyone argues that in court and a judge signs off on it uh, at the Rule 16b conference. So with that, this concludes our first of our educational series. Stand by and we'll be seeing you very soon. And thank you for checking out the Legal Geeks YouTube channel. Thank you.